Let's be clear. The biggest fear people have about guns in the United States is homicide. There are lots of ways to look at the data, and most don't make the United States look very good. Prepare for a deep dive. Homicide and guns are the topic of this special episode of Healthcare Triage. In 2016, in the American Journal of Medicine, researchers looked at how the United States compared to other countries in the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development with respect to violent death rates. They used 2010 mortality data from the World Health Organization to examine 23 countries. They calculated the death rates per 100,000 population and broke down the findings by age and sex. They found that homicide rates were seven times higher in the United States than in other high-income countries. Most of this difference seemed to be attributable to gun-related homicides. The United States had a rate of homicide by gun that was 25 times higher than other countries. If you just looked at the rates for those between 15 and 24 years old, the rates in the United States were 49 times higher than other countries. Unintentional firearm deaths were also more than six times higher in the United States compared to other countries. And this is what will keep you up at night. Among this data set of countries in the OECD, 82% of all people killed by guns were in the United States. 90% of all women killed by guns were in the United States. 91% of kids up to age 14 years and 92% of kids 15 to 24 killed by guns were killed in the United States. I used to live in Seattle, right across the border in Vancouver, British Columbia. The two cities have a lot in common, but one is in the United States and the other is in Canada. It's often hard to do direct international comparisons because so many things differ, but these two cities are much more alike than others. And a study in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1988 compared them with respect to guns and crime. Researchers used two different measures to estimate differences in gun ownership between the two cities. They found that 12% of people in Vancouver own guns compared to 41% in Seattle a little more than three times as many. The rates of gun-related homicide were more than five times higher in Seattle. Though. There was no compensatory murder by other than gun in Vancouver. The rates of justifiable killings, which would argue that handguns can protect people, were higher in Seattle, but accounted for less than 4% of homicides in both cities. And this is one of the most widely cited reasons to own a gun. Remember that healthcare triage is filmed in Indiana. I, and I imagine Stan and Mark, know many people who own guns and keep them in their homes. Pretty much the single biggest reason people say they want them there is to protect them and their families from intruders and crime. But in 1993, Art Kellerman and others published a paper that questions that rationale. He conducted a case control study of homicides that took place in victims' homes. He looked at three counties in Washington State, Tennessee, and Ohio. They had a range of racial, ethnic, and socio-demographic levels. Let's start by just looking at the demographics of the homicides. During the study period, 1,860 homicides occurred, and 24% of them took place in the home of a victim. Just over half the homicides were in the context of a romantic triangle or an argument in the house. Another 5% were murder-suicides. No intruder no protection necessary. But 8% of homicides occurred as part of a drug deal and 22% as part of another felony, like a rape, burglary, or robbery. But here's the thing. 77% of the victims were killed by a relative or someone known to them. Strangers or intruders accounted for less than 4% of the cases. In the rest of the cases, the perpetrator couldn't be identified or the death involved police acting in the line of duty. Attempted resistance was reported in 44% of these cases. In less than 4% were victims killed under legally excusable circumstances. And almost a third of those were shot by police in the line of duty. In only 2 to 3% of the cases did a private citizen act in self-defense. Some homicides involve protecting yourself from an armed intruder, but it's the exception, not the rule. Let's look at the case control analysis, though. After controlling for other things, like whether a household contained an illicit drug user, a person with prior arrests, someone who had previously had a fight in the home, etc., they found that keeping a gun in the home was strongly and independently associated with an increased risk of homicide with an odds ratio of 2.7. Having a gun in the home was a risk factor for homicide in the home, not a deterrent. And almost all of the risks stemmed from homicide by family members or intimate acquaintances. I'm gonna stop here and note that this isn't a discussion of rights. You may believe that none of this matters because all these people had a right to own a gun. Okay, we're talking about the studies 
not legal rights. Later, in 2004, researchers conducted an exhaustive review of the literature for all the relevant studies on firearms and homicide. They concluded that higher rates of gun ownership are associated with higher homicide rates. There was no evidence that owning a gun would lower the homicide rate. I'll admit, almost none of the data is causal, but what we have is consistent with the hypothesis that higher levels of gun prevalence substantially increase the homicide rate. I'm gonna quote more of their findings. The state evidence is particularly compelling, even after accounting for poverty, unemployment, alcohol consumption, urbanization and crime levels for both genders and for virtually every age category, states with more guns and typically more permissive gun laws experience significantly higher homicide rates. Another study in 2007 showed that there's a strong correlation between the percent of people who have guns in the home and the homicide rate, even after controlling for robbery rates. It's an association, so we can't rule out reverse causality, but again, this isn't in a vacuum. Place it alongside all of the other research I've discussed. A meta-analysis published in Annals of Internal Medicine in 2014 looked at all the studies that examined access to firearms and outcomes between participants with and without that access. They found 16 observational studies that looked at this, and they found significant relationships between access to guns and increased risk of homicide. We should acknowledge that it's possible to find arguments that gun ownership isn't related to homicides. One of the most notable researchers in this area is John Lott, who also wrote the book, More Guns, Less Crime. One of his main arguments is that increasing gun ownership reduces a state's homicide rate. But he used data from two election exit polls by news organizations in the 1988 and 1996 presidential elections to measure gun ownership rates as rising from 27% to 37%. Pretty much every other survey of household gun ownership showed levels decreasing over this time, though. And even the group that conducted the survey argues that their data shouldn't be used to determine state-level gun ownership. Actual voters don't necessarily represent the population at large. He's written many papers on the subject, and he's used many arguments on top of the one I just said, and the analysis can get complicated. But if you want a thorough discussion of the issues and complications in some of his analyses, I'll point you to an unbelievably detailed review from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, links below. Bottom line, there are good reasons to think many of his associations don't hold up. Another researcher who argues strongly against gun control is Gary Kleck. In a paper in 2004, he argued that many prior studies linking gun ownership to bad outcomes were flawed. He's not wrong. Some make questionable choices, like assuming that sales of guns and ammo magazine issues can be used as a proxy for gun ownership. The studies we're citing above try to avoid these mistakes for the most part. It's important not to cherry pick, and we've tried not to do that here. You can note that I've cited the systematic reviews and meta-analyses. But besides these findings, which are upsetting, is the unbelievable lack of good research in this area. Our government does not like funding research on guns. Neither do the vast majority of private groups. The lack of literature on the subject is kind of shocking. What's clear in the data is that mass killings, which occupy a huge part of our collective consciousness, constitute a tiny percentage of homicides. While mass killing events are terrible and get a lot of attention, the rates of these happenings are pretty steady, not an epidemic by any means, and the number of victims hasn't changed much either. It's hard to follow. What is a mass shooting? Many organizations define it as a shooting with four or more casualties, not just deaths. The FBI defines mass murder as a shooting where four or more people are killed, not including the perpetrator. The FBI also excludes domestic violence incidents. By the former definition, there were 385 mass shootings in 2016. By the latter, there were 25 mass murders. Most of the biggest shootings on record occurred in the last decade. So yes, the outliers have been more concerning, but we want better data. Mother Jones published a comprehensive guide with data up to this year. They defined cases as those where the killer took the lives of at least four people, were carried out by a lone shooter in a public place. The perpetrator couldn't count as one of the victims. Of the 62 cases between 1982 and 2012, 79% involved guns legally obtained. About a third of the guns would have been illegal under the assault weapons ban of 2013. That's a tragedy, don't get me wrong but two thirds were carried out with guns that weren't assault weapons. And before we get into the weeds of the ban, later episode, let's acknowledge that guns are pretty deadly even if they're not defined as assault weapons. Further, take a minute and reflect on those numbers. In those 30 years, there were 62 events, and even that's up for debate. The Washington Post gathered up estimates. 
The FBI reported 160 active shooter incidents from 2000 through 2013, an average of about 11 per year. The Congressional Research Service counted 296 episodes of mass murder with firearms over that time for an average of 21 per year. In 2012, Congress lowered the threshold for a mass shooting from four deaths to three, so more recent data are even hard to interpret. But this all misses the point. We spend so much time and energy covering the mass shootings when they account for less than 2% of all the gun deaths in America. It's not the mass shootings. It's the everyday shootings that are the issue. Moreover, most of those gun deaths, they're not homicides, they're suicides. That's the topic of the next episode of Healthcare Triage. <laughs> Healthcare Triage is funded in part by viewers like you through Patreon, a service that allows you to support the show through a monthly donation. Your support makes this show bigger and better. We'd especially like to thank Joe Sevitz and Sam. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Sam. More information can be found at patreon.com slash healthcaretriage.